This week's episode is sponsored by HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supply company in Scotland, where you can buy your whole kitchen online with all the prices on show, no gimmicks, just straightforward good deals for high quality kitchens and appliances. You can buy your kitchen from the comfort of your own home instead of getting pestered by pushy salespeople. Check out HIF Kitchens, the number one online kitchen supplier in Scotland. You've worked with Madonna, Prince, mm-hmm. Michael Jackson, The Beckhams, Donna Taylor Versace, Kate Moss, Jay Z, Elton John. The list is long. It's yeah, massive. Yeah, it's a lot bigger than that. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said at 16, was it Freddie Mercury who gave you your first line of coke? <laughs> yes, I was playing a cafe, a club called Cafe de Paris in Leicester Square on a Wednesday night, and Stevie Wonder came in and he, they brought Stevie over and he was like can I have this record and I was like no fuck off go and get it yourself and they were like this is Stevie Wonder and I was like I know I can see <laughs> that's kind of when the, the drug taking started going from the odd gram every night to an eighth an afternoon and, mm-hmm. and to half you know half ounce and blah 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 I lost the house you lose everything. yeah of course I lost the house within a year you know uh, that went I, le- I remember leaving that house with uh one mirror, the mirror that I used to, to, to rack up on. And I left that house and just left everything else there. I got this thing called meth mouth where I thought that I had animals living in my mouth, in my gums, and I would dig at them and dig at them and dig at them and rub. And what I was doing was like pulling the teeth and pulling the teeth and wobbling them. I'd been out for about four days and I was, kind of, it was, it was in the crystal meth era. era. And I, I came back to Pimlico and I was in my flat and I thought, I can't do this anymore. And I went to Vauxhall Bridge and I sat on the bridge and was going to throw myself in and I had no cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to my house yeah. to get the cigarettes and I sat on the sofa and I thought, oh, fuck it. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got DJ Fat Tony. Hi, James. How are you, Tony? I'm good, you good? Yeah, thanks for inviting me down to your house. You're welcome. It's like um, fucking Jurassic Park in here. <laughs> there are some dinosaurs yeah. around here. Don't worry yeah. about that. Definitely You've, dinosaurs. Um, had a very colourful life, Tony. You've done over a million pounds in drugs. You've yeah, that's a, yeah. DJed to the biggest stars in the world. I've actually written their names down. You've worked with Madonna, Prince, mm-hmm. Michael Jackson, the Beckhams, Donna Taylor Versace, Kate Moss, Jay Z, Elton John. The list is long. It's yeah, massive. it's a lot bigger than that. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not playing my own trumpet. I mean, you know, that, that, a lot of those, you know, were in, in the uh, when in my using. But since I got clean, uh, I mean, I've worked for everybody, yeah. like so many people. It's, it's, it's amazing. phenomenal. You're the career you've had. You were, yeah. you were an addict for so many years, but changed your life. Now you're 13 years clean. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. How are you feeling with that? Amazing. I, uh, you know, for me, uh, the party the party just begun when I got clean. It, you know, people think, oh, your party ends when you get sober. But it, for me, it was the opposite, you know, because yeah. I, I was never in the party. Now I am. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's a, a totally different experience. And life is for living. And drinking and taking drugs every day wasn't living. Yeah. Fair play, man. It, it takes a lot of courage to make changes. I always go back to the start with my guest, Tony. Yeah, sure. Where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, I actually grew up, I was born in the house opposite here Mm -hmm. in Pimlico uh, and my mum fell down the stairs and had me a month early. I was meant to be born on Christmas Day, so I kind of always like to think of myself as Jesus. Jesus. (laughs) Yeah, but I was a breach, which kind of says a lot as well, always ask first. But uh, So yeah, I grew up in the first few years in Pimlico and then moved to Battersea, which is just over the bridge, and grew up on on, on a a council estate there. We had a house. So we, you know, um, me and my two brothers and my mum and dad, and growing up there kind of was tough because you know it was an estate and uh and there was gangs of kids and i, I you know i i kind of never wanted to fit in with the gangs of kids mm. my brothers did my older brother was like kind of 
quite tough and he was like uh, one of the uh, toughest kids on the estate so there was no one ever really said much to me do you know what mm -hmm. I mean yeah. I said a lot to them but yeah. no one really said much to mm -hmm. me I was kind of so growing up I, you know I never came out I, as a gay man I was always gay and my mum always knew my dad always knew my dad hated it but you know it, there wasn't much he could do about mm -hmm. it so growing up in Batsy kind of you know uh being the the middle one, so I had an older brother and a younger brother. But the, my older brother was from my mum's first marriage, and there was he was always in trouble with the police. So he got all the attention. So to get attention in a house, you had to you had, kind of had to be heard, mm -hmm. make yourself heard. My little brother came along; he was my dad's golden child. Do you know what I mean? And I was mm -hmm. I was the one in the middle. So you know, uh, growing up in in that environment, you kind of learn really quickly. Uh, learned behaviours as such like if you want attention you have to set fire to the house as such do you yeah. get what I mean and kind of that's yeah. what I did did you have abandonment issues then being the black sheep of the family I kind of uh, to a certain extent yeah I kind of just think you know I was never abandoned but I kind of just think that uh, I didn't get the attention I deserved mm -hmm. <laughs> do you get what I mean yeah. it was like my brothers my mum and dad were always like concentrating on those two yeah how was it being coming out as gay then back in the day uh, it was all you know for me it was okay because uh, I, I always just did my own thing, you know. Uh, I would leave the house at 14 in drag just to wind my dad up. My dad, <laughs> my dad, my dad was six foot four, like mm -hmm. a plumber. He had, his fingers were like bananas, right? You know, yeah. if you, if you, my dad brought us up to, if we had a fight or we got picked on, my dad would throw us out of the house and make him go and batter him, otherwise he'd batter us. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the upbringing. You know, we were brought to, we were brought up to stand up for ourselves. So being gay and if anyone ever challenged me on it, I would fight them. Mm -hmm. You know, that was my first option. Pick up a brick and hit them with it, you know. Yeah. Um, so, go, so coming out for me wasn't really an issue in that sense because I always knew what I was and, and my, my mum and dad did and I kind of flaunted the fact that I was gay. Yeah. I flaunted that in people's faces. Yeah, you owned that. You, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. So how was the teenage years then? How was... So, um, you know, uh, growing up, my dad, was a, my dad used to be like a, a binge drinker. So at weekends, he would get drunk. And then on a Sunday morning, my mum would be either at the bottom of the stairs or calling an ambulance because she would have took an overdose. My dad, whenever he drank scotch, he, uh, whiskey, he, he turned into a demon. A de like a, he was a complete and utter bastard. And I would wake up and I would have to take my mum to hospital and stuff like that. And, you know, growing up, and I'd, it, my dad's side of the family, uh, there was a lot of alcoholism in that as well. And so my aunties and uncles were all, like my uncle wasn't actually, my aunties were, they were all alcoholics and they would come to our house and uh, cause havoc. And I loved them, you know, I, I loved them. And uh, yeah, so there was a lot of alcoholism and a lot of violence yeah. and a lot of uh, trauma going on. So that became normal to you? Uh, yeah, it did. And you know, what happened was because, as I said before, there was like... Uh, that era of me wanting seeking attention what happens is when you seek that kind of attention p people find you yeah. you know so I've, there was a, there was a, um, I, I started working for this kid uh, this bloke when I was at, uh, at the age of 10 he, he, show, he showed films in youth clubs <laughs> and uh, of course he was a sexual predator and basically he uh, sexually abused me for about four, four years but um, during that time, I kind of turned it around. I kind of owned it. And it, so I was sexualized at a really young age mm -hmm. from 10 onwards. So that kind of was suddenly this new drug, this thing that could change everything, yeah. sex. Mm -hmm. So uh, the majority of the time I was either getting in trouble or having sex. Yeah. yeah I, but you're just um, replacing that with the trauma and the pain that you'd felt. Because again, totally. seeing your mum at the bottom of the stairs and seeing other alcoholics and being abused, that is going to mentally scar you. And you have yeah. your defence mechanism, your shield was. What age did you start drinking, Tony? I started drinking. Well, I, you know what? For me, it, drinking was was one of the things that I thought I'm never going to do because I saw my dad and my aunties and everybody else getting drunk and, and what it did to them. I always thought, no, this isn't for me. Uh, but of course, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's in my blood, you know. Uh, so I started drinking around the age of 15, 15, yeah. Uh, I got kicked out of school at 14 for having sex with a drama teacher. And um, the school decided they no longer wanted me there and, and they didn't want to call the police because it was, you know, 
back then it was yeah it would have been the biggest scandal so I left school really young and uh, I started working in a place called the King's Road in, in London which at the time was like uh, social media people would walk up and down on King's Road it was where punk started you know people would that was their like that was their Facebook they would go there on a Saturday walk up and down go in all the shops hang out and be seen and be photographed and I worked in a place called the Great Gear Market and after work we used to go to this pub on the corner called the Chelsea Potter and uh you know, at first I just used to drink Coke and Coca-Cola. I used to be like, no, I don't want to And of course, straight away, to fit in with everybody else, I started drinking cider mm -hmm. and snake bite and, and stuff like that. And it wasn't very long before I was kind of always the last one to leave the pub. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think the alcohol took your pain away a bit? Your method of thinking? Well, you know, what happened was I got, uh, prior to that, I got really fat. I, I kind of put on loads of weight. It was it became my shield. It became like, okay, this is my, this is my wall. Don't come near mm -hmm. me. Uh, so being fat brought its own tra trauma as yeah. well, you know, because suddenly you've gone from getting all the attention that you, you didn't deserve and didn't want, but you, I turned it around and that, that empowered me. And suddenly I, I put on all this weight so that no one would come near me as a, as a barrier. Yeah. And then of course people call you fat and everything else that goes with it. So the trauma, it was adding to more yeah, trauma. Yeah. So the alcohol did, yeah, it cushioned that. Yeah, and losing the confidence because I've had girls on the show who've been abused and they end up putting on a lot of weight because if they think they're fat and ugly, nobody no one's will go near abuse them, which 100%. is fucking scary and it's heartbreaking to think that. But <laughs> Listen, you're looking great now, by the way. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so well, I was got, going to ask that question, Fat no, Tony, got, is that where it started from? I've got no better what the uh, Fat Tony yeah. is, exactly where it come from. So people would call me that name behind my back and go, which Tony? And they go, oh, Fat Tony, you know. So I kind of owned it. I just took it. You know, I lost all that weight at about 16 and a half, 17, and just owned it. You know, I kept the name. Uh, How does it make you feel with the name? Do you um, embrace it? You're happy with it? it oh, I'm totally happy with it. You know, yeah. I would have changed it a long time ago. You know, one thing I've learned about life is if I'm not happy, I, I won't do it. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I did things that made me unhappy for a very long mm -hmm. time. And you said at 16, was it Freddie Mercury who gave you your first line of coke? <laughs> yes, basically what happened was, so I, I, I was... There's this club in London called Heaven, which was like at the time Europe's biggest gay club. And on Saturday nights, it was men only. And I, I told my mum and dad that I was going to uh, away with the scouts for the weekend. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I went down there and I remember, I, I tell this to, you know, I was wearing a, a white Fiorucci t-shirt and it had two cherubs and angel wings. And I stood outside Heaven against the wall, terrified to go in, absolutely terrified to go in. And because uh, it was men only, I was just terrified of it. And uh, this group of men came along and um, were like, oh, right, nice T-shirt. And I was like, oh, thanks. You know, all proud of my T-shirt. And uh, they were like, what are you doing? And I was like, I'm waiting for a friend. <laughs> and it was like someone's, and this guy on the door said he's been waiting for his friend for like five hours. And I was like, yeah, he hasn't turned up yet. And they were like, <laughs> why don't you come in with us? So I went in with them and uh, I like, you know, I, and I always say this, that I actually didn't know who Freddie was, you know, it was just a group of men and uh, so I hung out with them all night and then they were like at the end of the night they were going back to to uh, to uh, Holland Park to his house and I was like yeah I'll come and I got offered you know there was a plate going around and I was offered it and I was like no 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 I don't do drugs and then as I got more and more drunk, someone said, oh, look, try this. It will, like, wake you up. And I was like, okay. And it was Freddie. So, yeah, he gave me my first line. But, you know, um, I hated it. Yeah. I absolutely hated the feeling that cocaine gave me. It wasn't one of those drugs where you just, I thought, oh, my God, I've arrived. It was actually like, oh, no, I don't like this feeling. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I thought, oh, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> So how was your life then between 16 and 21? What was the, what was the transition period? What was your life then? How did you like, get into DJing? Oh, so basically, I mean, it, it, it was kind of a whirlwind. For, so from, going, from working in the great gear market uh, straight away into clubbing. So I was, after going out on that Saturday night, I would go out every night of the week. It started going on. Uh, I, the job that I had in the great gear market was selling clothes and I would rob about 200 quid a day out of the till. Got very addicted to stealing really quickly. Yeah. Uh, and of course, everyone was wearing designer clothes back then. So I would leave work, go to a shop called Jones, which sold every, every designer clothing under the sun. And I would get decked out every night I would buy new clothes just to go out in and I, and, and so it, you know that because suddenly clubbing became my life I got the sack from Great Gear Market after about two years <laughs> funnily enough <laughs> for tax reasons she said and uh, so I got sacked from there and uh, 
uh, just literally started going like just made clubbing my life and then I, I you know I was one gift that I was born with was a big mouth and I you know my insecurities made me really loud so I, the, the louder I was it was also like a shield so yeah. I would be so loud and in your face that it, I it was a way of keeping you away from me yet again it was a shield it was never letting anyone in because I would like start around start insulting you mm. being just really awful no trust issues yeah totally so that no one could ever get close and uh, was um so you know during that time my uh these guys called rusty egan and steve strange who were like basically running london nightlife then uh were opening a new a new club on a saturday night at the lyceum in the strand where the lion king is at the moment that massive theater yeah and um i remember going up to him and saying i'm opening a club on the same night <laughs> It's like 16, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You know, like full of fucking yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I remember like Rusty saying to me, well, why are you doing that? Because all of my friends are going to come. By this point, I had quite a good little friend, like mm -hmm. a friend circle, uh, you know, because London was very small, so everybody knew each other. You know, there was, it's not like it is now where you've got Shoreditch, you've got other areas. Yeah. Clubbing existed only in the West End of mm -hmm. London. That was it. You know, there was like four or five clubs. Everybody knew each other. And that was how it worked. So uh, I remember saying to Rusty, yeah, I'm going to do this. And he was like, well, why don't you come and work on the door for us? So I blagged my way into that, mm -hmm. that job and uh, I basically let everyone in for free. And I, every week I would say, oh, the music shit, man. Everyone's leaving. And they weren't. I just said it. You know, yeah. mate, and he was like, well, why? And I said, well, they're all moaning about the DJ. And that's, bearing in mind, I never, ever set out to be a DJ. I never, ever thought, okay, this is going to be my career. I want, you know, this is my life goal. Mm -hmm. You know, practicing at home every day. You know, that never happened. And he, he, Rusty said to me, well, if you can do better, why don't you do it? And I was like, all right, I will. And then the next week I turned up with four records. <laughs> four, well, well, do you four, know? Yeah, I do. Is Pink Cadillac by... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, what's her name Natalie Cole uh, it was a, a divine record Take It Like a Man uh, it was uh, an ABC record they just had a remix done and there was what was the fourth one uh, Chaka Khan Ain't Nobody uh, Khan. the 12 inch and I turned up with them in a little carrier bag and uh, played those four records and the B-sides and that was kind of it within like a month I had a residency at the WAG Club on a Tuesday night. <laughs> uh, within two months, three months, I was flying to New York. Yeah. So what happened was we did this club on a Tuesday night, me and my friend Stephen Linnard called Total Fashion Victim. And it was, it was absolutely empty. It was a fucking Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? In the West End of London. But the right people come. And then what happened was one week, we, like, we'd been open for about a month and, and Andy Warhol turned up. He was in London. They came in and they, he was with this guy called Steve. And I was just like, oh, hi, blah, 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 talking to them. And it was Steve Rebell, basically, who at the time did Studio 54 and then was opening the Palladium, which was like this big club in New York. And they basically, that night, you know, yet again, the gift of the gab. I started, you know, I talked to them, had a laugh with them. Um, and he stayed about 10 minutes and fucked off because he was a freak. But, you know... Uh, but with uh, Steve, he stayed all night and we, we got on all really well. And then within two weeks later, I was going to New York every other, every other week, flying to New York. So you blagged your way just... Blagged my way into uh, all of yeah. it. It was never about my love. I mean, I've always had a love and passion for music, always. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up in Battersea, my elder brother always played music. My mum and dad, I, you know, would play music. Yeah. I'd wake up every weekend listening to the likes of Elvis and Gene Pitney and stuff like that. And then yeah. my elder brother, as he got older, he got into like Lover's Rock and all our early mm -hmm. soul music. So yeah. I kind of was brought up on music. Yeah. I always had a How passion. How was it then when you started getting all the attention, the fame, how did that fuel your drug addiction? Did it? I didn't really have a drug addiction then. Oh. So for me, it was kind of like always the party. You know, so uh, the more I was out, the more I would get drunk. And the more I would get drunk, the more I thought, okay, I need some cocaine. And mm -hmm. uh, my friend Paul, I remember him saying to me one weekend at, at the playground, which was at the Lyceum, he's like, do you want some coke? And I was like, no. Because at this time in London, there was a massive heroin a massive heroin problem. Yeah. Everybody was on, on smack. Literally, every other person in, in London nightlife was on smack. And that wasn't my thing. I kind of thought, I kept looking at my friends and thinking, why? I, I don't want to be like, you know, they were all gouging out. You'd be, you'd be having a conversation with them and they'd start like spilling, like pouring sugar in their tea and carry on pouring it because yeah. they went into this like complete 
comatose state and I, and I thought no that's not for me I remember this night Paul said to me do you want some cocaine and I was like no I don't like it and he was like no it will, it will take the edge off things and I was like alright yeah again go on then mm-hmm. and uh, that was it you could jump 28 years because I literally just bought it every day and used it every day um, but I didn't I, I don't think that I had a problem with it because it was still partying mm-hmm. do you know what I mean yeah. it wasn't until a few years later when uh, clubs like the Limelight opened in London where I kind of blagged a job with them as well you know I went to them and was like look you can't open a club in London without having me involved yeah. and uh, they made me they made me musical director <laughs> put me on there. <laughs> like 2k a week yeah. back then in the 80s it was mad I was like for doing what for doing mm-hmm. for doing absolutely yeah. nothing and that's kind of when the addiction kind of started off really badly you know I kind of would be up uh, for days on end um just taking cocaine but I still didn't think it was a problem who were you partying with back then oh everybody you know you know because my, my circle of friends from that time all suddenly started getting famous they all started doing becoming film directors they all started you know there was a, the 80s was a really creative time because mm-hmm. we didn't have social media yeah you know you had to late clubs were your social media yeah they totally were and, and to get a voice or to to create a platform you had to do something yeah. How the yeah. fuck, though, did you rise through the ranks so fast and become this global name to be working with... How did the working with Michael Jackson come about? Uh, so, I kind of working with, with working with the likes of them, it all stemmed from, like, just literally London nightlife in the sense of my circle of friends, like Boy George. George became one of the biggest stars on the planet at that yeah. time. So, everybody wanted everything to be associated with George. They wanted... So, you know, I was this DJ that was Boy... You know, his friends friends with this one, friends with that one. And those people would come to the party. So people employed me because they knew they were going to get those people at their party. Yeah. And kind of, <clears throat> it just stemmed from that. So, you know, people in record companies would come to the clubs I was playing in. And, and then when the artists would come to town, they were like, you've got to get this DJ. He's the only DJ you can get, you know, that's worth getting. And mm-hmm. so that's kind of it. And then, you know, I started working for like, as you say, Madonna and all of those people, Prince, Every time Prince came to town, I would do his gigs. You know, Prince was one of those amazing people that would have a concert at the O2 or, which would well, he weren't the O2 then, but you know, at Wembley and yeah. stuff like that, sell it out. But each night would have, have his own party after the gig, uh, which he would invite 100 people to and he would play live at that mm-hmm. as well. And I would DJ all of those. So I kind of did that and I did DJ for Madonna's 30th birthday and then suddenly went on, was on tour with her because I got really friendly with her yeah. brother. Just literally, that's how it works. It all worked. <laughs> from, from having like, your Shaka Khan album to... From having Shaka Khan 12 yeah. inch to like flying... <laughs> you know, at 18, I was flying on Concord. Yeah. Literally to New York and back all the time. Like mm-hmm. George would ring me and go, we're going to New York in an hour. Do you want to come? And I'd be like, yep, yeah, I'm there. Mm-hmm. And like literally just go and get on Concord. How it was did insane. that make you feel though, thinking through the trauma and the pain that you went through from such a young age to be working with the biggest A-listers in the world did you ever stop and think I'm doing great or was it just so fast that you couldn't remember no, I never stopped and thought I was doing great because you know I have this addict personality that always tells me I'm not doing good you know I could be flying in first class and I will sit there thinking oh my god everyone's going to hate you when you get off you know that imposter syndrome seeks in and you know it still does it today sometimes but you know uh, at that point in time it was so fast and I kind of was just carried away with it in the sense of okay they all want me they they you know they this is the life that I had you know I kind of just bled into my my best friend's fame and my best friend's success I kind of had that success and thought I was on the same level as that. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, but you, you must have a great talent to for to still working with these people. So I wouldn't undervalue yourself for oh, what no, you've but achieved. I, you know, but as I said before, it's not that addict. But my addict thinking will always undervalue me. Yeah, yeah. That's why today I have to have people that value. You know, that are yeah. my, in my team. Pick your spirits will, up. Yeah, you know, it's like just I know my self worth today. You know, it's yeah. taken me 13 and a half years to find that self worth. Mm. What was Prince like? Prince was amazing. Prince was made. The first time I met Prince was, I was DJing in a club called Browns, and uh, he came in, and it was it was uh, there was no one there <laughs> apart from me, <laughs> Prince, and about five of, five of his entourage, and he kept coming up to me, giving me uh, the, the his, his um, bodyguard kept coming up, going, Prince said, can you play this? And I was like, no, sorry don't take requests mm-hmm. and then they came up and gave me 100 quid and I played it and that, of course you know <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that was kind of it and, that, and because I said no and because I would be like tell him to fuck off do you know what I mean mm-hmm. I, uh, 
I'm not doing it. They kind of all love that. They kind yeah. of love the fact that I did that. You know, I remember once I was playing a, cafe, a club called Cafe de Paris in Leicester Square on a Wednesday night and Stevie Wonder came in and uh, I was playing this sweet Pussy Pauline track at the time, back in the mid-80s mid when the, all the New York um, bitch tracks came out, all those like house tracks with like all the, all the, like, you know, the uh, drag queens on them. And I was playing this track and he, they brought Stevie over and he was like, can I have this record? And I was like, no, fuck off, go and get it yourself. And they were like, this is Stevie Wonder. And I was like, I know, I can see. <laughs> and I, and I thought afterwards, I thought you kind of said the wrong thing there. <laughs> But, you know, straight away yeah. they love me. And the next minute I'm getting booked for Stevie Wonder. Yeah. Do you go, I mean, it's absolutely insane. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal, the names you have just mentioned there. That's phenomenal. You know, it's kind of just, it was It was just because of the time, you know. It's like, you know, uh, George Michael, you know, he was another, he, you know, I love George. George was one of the most, I was in awe of George. But because I was in Team Boy George, and they, they, those right, two, yeah, yeah, totally, man. Uh you know, so it was kind of all because I was associated with the other George. We kind of kept our distance, but we 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 become friends secretly mm. <laughs> without the other George knowing. And it's just like that all come to a big abrupt ending. As Did well. they find out? Oh yeah, it's like yeah. I ended up having a fight with him, and then it was on the front page of all the papers. Uh, yeah. Why? Why, why did they two have an eye with the boy George and George Michael? Because George Michael, because George George Michael was in. It was always in the closet, and George hated him for that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we all knew. Of course we all knew. But, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, that no one else was meant to know. And George kind of, George just, you know, it, there, there wasn't room for two Georges. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy, man, to think that all those massive names. How do you look, how do you see it now when you see like guys like uh, George Michael, Whitney Houston, Elvis, Prince, Michael Jackson, the kind of all with like, addiction issues that kind of ruined mm. their life. How do you see that? Do you see why they go down that route? Or is it just... I think, you know, what, with, with all of those people, you know, it, 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 the butt stops with... Firstly, they're, they, you know, they have, an addic they have addiction problems, you know. Um, but the, the, it's, it's, the, the reason that they get away with this is because what happens is when you... With success... You, you get yes people, you know, the, the people are there are you, in your team say, I want this, I want that, get me it. No, everybody's really scared to say no mm. to you and no one will say no to you because especially if they're on the payroll. And normally what happens is we, when people get so successful, they lose reality in the sense of their friends that will say, what are you doing? You're, you're out of control because they, the team surrounds them like a castle yeah. wall. So to get to speak to one of your best mates, you have to go through three different people. Do you know what I mean? And by the time you get there, you you know, they're like, oh, you you, you know, the friendship gets very very uh, distant. distant. Yeah. yeah, because you have to get through so many fucking portcullises and towers to get mm. to your mate, and because they're suddenly surrounded by yes people and payroll people, so those payroll people will do as they're told. And then what happens within that industry? Nine times out of ten, they want you. They want that their artist to stay sick so they can control yeah. them. Do you think that? Do you think you're getting used a lot as well back in the day? A lot of people want to be a friend, just manipulate. Oh, hundred percent. But you know, I turn, I always knew that. Yeah, that was I always you. knew that. I, I, you know, I. It was more of a case of what you could do for me than what mm. I could do for you. You know, I'd put, I'd let people into clubs. I'd put people on guest lists for concerts, whatever. You know, but they had to have something that I wanted. And yeah. nine times out of ten, that was drugs. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It, I, it's someone, if you know. I probably had six or seven drug dealers on my list every night. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And it would start with the best one yeah. and then it would like go down to yeah. the worst drug dealer. But he was always there mm -hmm. just in case the others yeah. didn't turn up. So you had the drug addiction, but you also had the sex addiction. Yes. Yeah, so you say yeah. like eight men a night at some point. Uh, yeah, a day, yeah. Some of it are shagging. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, you know it's, it, it's like any... It, it, people always... With se when you talk about sex addiction, people always think, oh my God, yeah, he's got it. He's the man in the sense of okay you know sex is like heroin yeah when you're an addict you use whether it be sex cocaine heroin whatever drug you're using alcohol you use it for one reason only, yeah. one reason only in addiction and that's to destroy yourself so with sex addiction when i hear people go oh my husband was having an affair and he said that he's a sex addict i'm like fuck off oh uh, yeah no you know sex addicts don't have affairs yeah sex addict Sex addiction is about anonymous. It's about, it's a, it's about, it's like fast food. Fulfilling your own needs. Totally. And what it does is, you know, one is too many and a thousand is never enough, as we say in most fellowships.
relationships and that you know and it's exactly the same with with sex if you you have sex with one person and, and you want them out as soon as, as soon as they, you've come or they've come you want them out of the house mm-hmm. so you can get the next one in and what it does is I used to describe it as like having pizza delivered <laughs> six times a day and then at six <laughs> o'clock still being still being yeah, starving yeah. still sitting uh-huh. there still you know yeah. because it was just, it was so meaningless. Sex was like having a glass of water. Yeah. But uh, Everything, all it was just so soul yeah. destroying. And mm-hmm. you know, what it does is it chisels away at your self worth, your self esteem, you know, literally leaves you exactly like. Confidence. Like, yeah, totally. It just wants you in a room, yeah. locked in a room. Yeah, feeling worthless, like, like an escort, a prostitute. It's just kind of everything empty they say sex is sexual energy exchange so if you're sleeping with just random people you're exchanging energies well, as you well know, there's no intimacy involved in it. and what you do is you run away from that intimacy so what, you exhaust yourself in that and especially if you're in a relationship what you are left with at the end of it is just a wreck you don't want to have sex with your partner yeah. because you've, you, you've driven yourself so far away from intimacy with the anonymous sex side of things yeah. that you, when it comes to loving someone you don't love yourself anymore yeah. so you can't love anyone else yeah. and, and, it, and, it, and it's so soul destroying it really is it's most potent and silent one of them all really yeah and it can be the most heartbreaking, but it can also be the most blissfulness if, yeah, if it's mean, done right. You, like you say, you must love within first before you can love anyone else. And 100%. If you're low vibrational, if you're a drug addict, sex addict, everybody's just going to get used for your own powers and your own benefits. And why, And that's just it. It leaves you powerless. You know, you know, you are spiritually and emotionally bankrupt at the yeah. end of it because you've got nothing to give. You've mm-hmm. given it all away to absolute strangers. And the majority of them, you wouldn't even, you wouldn't stop to ask, that, you know, <laughs> Last of time, but you know, it, it, it takes you to that level. Yeah. You know, there was a point in in my using when I was uh, that I used to work in club like big clubs. I'd DJ to like three and a half thousand people, and I'd be out the back door, and I would end up in King's Cross, and there was this pub in King's Cross um, called. Uh, what was it called? Uh, I'll think of the name of it in a minute. Uh, and basically it was on a Sunday afternoon and they would have a, a, a club in the basement of this place and it would basically uh, had a paddling pool in it and people would be pissing on each other. And I would go there and I would make... and because uh, uh, First of all, I started going there because I knew no one would find me. Mm-hmm. My friends, my boyfriend, all those people wouldn't know where I was. The, the last place on earth they would think that I was was in this place mm-hmm. called Streams of Pleasure. <laughs> and uh, I'd be in there and I'd be like doing coke and it'd be like, and I, you know, I was thinking that I was like Madonna or something in there, you know. Mm. And people were like, I want to drink your piss. And I'd be like, you drink my piss, you'll be up for a month. <laughs> you, know, you ain't going to sleep again. But you know, it was just like I, I, the, play, the levels that I had to go to to feel normal, yeah. to feel less than it was, it was yeah. extreme. All the external stuff, all the negative stuff, which just fulfilling more emptiness in you, more loneliness. When did your life start spiraling? When, when you started hitting your peak of the fame, when did it really start spiraling? When you were taking every day, when it started about, getting to heavier drugs? Yeah, so ba- it's basically about just I, I just lost a partner to uh, in the AIDS epidemic. Tom, he died, and this is around about ninety two, ninety three, and it kind of that's kind of when it hit me hard. I just got a. Um, I, I just had a record deal and uh, had a record, a single out, and I just signed a free, free single and a, an album deal, and I had loads of money and I bought a house, um, in uh, just by Great Ormond Street Hospital, on Queen Square, very apt, and it was called the Cottage on Queen Square, mm-hmm. even more apt, mm-hmm. and uh, and it was like just the most amazing house, and 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 kind of, that's after the death of Tom kind of my addiction kind of just took because suddenly I had this low this even more found wealth and I kind of just had this house and that's kind of when the the drug taking started going from the odd gram every night to an eighth an afternoon and mm-hmm. and to half you know half ounce and blah 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 and that's kind of when it kind of really t- took a dark turn you know because cocaine was never enough that's when I started smoking crack. I started uh, doing tamazepam, diazepam, rohypnol. You know, I kind of ro- was roller coasting at that point. Uh, for every high that I was doing, I was doing downers. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, and I kind of started to believe my own hype and start kind of losing my friends really badly at that point because they were all getting in the way. It was at that point people would say to me, oh, you, you need to slow down. And if anyone says to you, you need to slow down when you're an addict, you're like, you need, you need to go. Yeah. You know, you're in my way, you're an obstacle. Mm. So I kind of started getting rid of all my friends and my friends started getting rid of me. And that's kind of when it, it took a really bad turn. 
Yeah, I lost the house. <laughs> yeah, of course, I lost the house within a year. Uh, you know, uh, that went... I, le- I remember leaving that house with uh, one mirror, the mirror that I used to, to, to rack up on. And I left that house and just left everything else there with, with a suitcase in the middle of the night, left. And I thought, you know, I lived in this world where I, whatever I had, I could always get again. Mm-hmm. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. I, that was my thinking. My thinking was, I was so unmaterialistic. I didn't think about, oh, I, I want this and I've got that. I would get stuff, either break it or lose it. That was like yeah. kind of the way it was. And so I left that house with one mirror and I remember thinking, fuck, you're homeless. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? And of course, a friend said to me, I've got a house you can move into. So I moved to Brick Lane. Um, How old were you then, Tony? About, I think it was, uh, so if it was 95, I'm 55 now, it's 2000, work it out. 30, uh, 40. No, 30. 30, yeah. Still young, man. Yeah, of course. Uh, in my prime. <laughs> I'm in my prime now. So, yeah, so I left there and I remember thinking at the time, I thought, fuck, you need to sort yourself out. You know, you've just mm-hmm. lost your house. Yeah. And I just thought, okay. So I moved into Brick Lane and, and off I run again. That was it, you know. Same old cycle. This By this point at the time, you know, we were tra- I was travelling all up the, up and down the, the country. Uh, Are you still working okay? Yes, still functioning? majorly. Majorly. My career never, my nev- my career never ever took a nosedive in that sense. But, you know, what happened was I stopped flying. So I started going up the motorway. I'd be like playing in Cardiff and places like this for like me and Danny Ramplin and all that lot for vast amounts of money. And I'd come back to London and I, you know, I'd be in the car all the way back to London thinking, oh my God, get me back to London. I need mm-hmm. to. And there, there was a club called Trade at that point, called a uh, club called Turn Mills which was London's all-night club, and I'd go to Turmills and stay in there for two days and then take people back to Brick Lane. I, and so it went again. Do mm-hmm. you get what I mean? Yeah. There was never any realisation of the sense of, OK, I need to stop this, apart from the odd hour here and there, on the, on the, on the tail end of a, of a massive binge. Yeah. When did you start? Because I know you started pulling your own teeth out. That was kind of like about... That, that was towards the end. That's kind of... So Why what did you was, do that? It's really weird, actually, because... Uh, because of crystal meth so basically this guy called Jason who I started seeing you know uh, yeah, an who, addict then I take it oh yeah, yeah, yeah. of course yeah, yeah. listen there could be 3,000 people in a room right yeah, you'll find and I addict. will find the yeah. only addict in there the one with the biggest problems <laughs> <laughs> the one, the one yeah, that's yeah, the most yeah. fucked up I will be drawn to that person yeah. because you're the exact same because what we do is like attracts know, like totally we put out that pheromone yeah you know I had no teeth and I would walk to Sainsbury's and I could pick up three men <laughs> do you know what I mean no, <laughs> because they were other addicts you know yeah. that's what we that, that's, yeah. that's what what we do we we you know it, it's kind of bizarre how mm-hmm. we find each other it's the laws of attraction and uh, so this guy Jason uh, who I started seeing who, he was the one you know they, every time I met someone yeah, they were the always one. the yeah, one yeah, yeah. for two days <laughs> this one's the one I'll introduce him to everyone yeah we're going to get married yeah. and all that bullshit that went with it and then a week later they're like what happened to him I'm like, oh yeah he's got to get rid of him he, yeah. you know he, 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 I kind of spent all his money and mm-hmm. did all these drugs and then sent him on his way but Jason was coming over all the time from New York and uh He'd bring Chris. He, he used to like he have a real problem with Tina, which was crystal meth. And he'd bring crystal meth over, and he'd be like, "Oh, do you want some Tina?" I'd be like, "No, no, no, I don't do that." The the magic words, no, 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 I don't do that. And of course, I was like, "Oh, one night I was at his house with him, and I was like, oh, give me that," and that was it. And within a, uh, within eight months, uh, I'd pulled all my teeth out. Uh, you know, I would get so psychotic and so. And I had this, you know, I, I, I've always bit my nails and the more high I would be, the more I'd be digging my mouth. And I got this thing called meth mouth where I thought that I had animals living in my mouth, in my gums, and I would dig at them and dig at them and dig at them and rub. And what I was doing was like pulling the teeth and pulling the teeth and wobbling them. And because I drank so much Jack Daniels and Coke and lived off Jack Daniels and Coke, the amount of sugar had been started to rot my teeth. And before I might, and you know, I'd smoke 200 Marlboro in, in the course of two days of staying awake. And, um, and that's not an exaggeration. I chain smoked unreal. Uh, so basically my gums would, would, were receding anyway. And then I got meth mouth where my mouth went septic and I would just, it was, and the amount of cocaine that I was taking and the amount of other drugs that I was on, I couldn't feel the pain. I would just dig and dig and dig. There was yeah. never any pain. I was never in pain. And I, I, yeah, I pulled all my teeth out and I ended up with one tooth at the bottom. 
But that was at, right towards the end, you know. For me... Did you lose everything then? Yeah. Friends, family? So I, I, I kind of was, you know, yet again made homeless. So my, my grandma died. I remember my grandmother dying and she left my mum all this money in these houses and they lived in Batsy in the family home. And they, they moved down to Dartford and they were like, OK, you know, I needed somewhere to live. And my mum was like, move into the house. <laughs> Biggest mistake ever. Move into the house. And within a week, I'd moved a crack dealer into one room, a ketamine dealer in as well. Turned the house, the family home, into a crack den. Mm -hmm. uh, and, <laughs> oh, God, that was, that was terrible, that time. Yeah. And then, of course, my dad, you know, my dad, who was an alcoholic who I blamed for most of my life. You know, my dad would like to say to me, you deserve everything you've got. And, you know, he was right at mm -hmm. the end of the day. But, you know, at that point, I'd be like, how can you say this to me? Yeah. You know, um, how dare you? And Because uh, it's learnt behaviour as well. Well, you've learnt that. A hundred percent. But you know what? I didn't realise that uh, my dad was 30 years sober and I never ever knew until what happened was um, a year into being clean I, I had a big drama uh with uh, i whacked a kid around the head with food that something got a lump of turf at my dog and i ended up being put in bail on bail down my mum and dad's house in dungeness and uh and i learned out there that my dad was never the problem do you know what i mean he was 30 years sober and i and i never ever gave him credit for it and um yeah, I don't know why I just jumped to that really quickly. But, uh, yeah, so going back to Battersea, yeah. I lived in Battersea and, uh, yeah, as I say, it didn't last very long and I moved into Pimlico. Into did, you think, sorry, did you forgive your dad? 100%. So yeah. what happened was I was put on bail down, the, uh, down in Dungeness and I, I literally uh, had to be in the house every evening from 6 o'clock because I was on tag. So is your dad alive? Is it, no, my dad... My, uh, yeah, I'll get to that big wind just came, yeah. No, so basically, uh, my dad uh, and mum lived in Dungeon, so I was ta on tag down there, and I had to be in every night at six, so suddenly I was with this person I'd hated all my life, yeah. who I blamed for everything. And very quickly, I realised that my dad was never the problem, mm -hmm. you know, and then I found out that he was 30 years sober, and, and it kind of just, like, made me look at my own behaviours and I really got it, out of that really dark time of me being on tag down there something really wonderful happened the fact that I got to know my father and my father wasn't the person I thought he was yeah. and uh, yeah he died a year after that yeah. he, so I got to, you know it was at the age of 41 being put down your mum and dad's house on tag <laughs> you know I wouldn't, if, if that incident had never happened I would never have got to know my father yeah. and I think that God really works in really mysterious ways yeah, that's that a beautiful sense. thing to get the closure because if you lose the loved one that you've never had that that trauma works week because when I says that when you spoke about your dad there, a big gust of wind came round this yeah, garden. He's yeah, here. Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I asked that. And I knew when you were talking about that story, you kind of changed the subject, but I wanted to get the yeah, what really happened. Did it bring yeah, back well, a lot of emotion for you? Oh, totally, 100%. Because, you know, I, I, within that year, I got to know him and I got to realise how much I actually respected him for who he was and, and all those things that he used to say to me, like, you deserve everything you get. He was saying because he cared. He, he was right. He'd he, been he, there. Yeah. And, you know, he could see me moving crack dealers into my house. He saw the destruction that, that went, you know, my mum was left all that money. I cleaned my mother out for all that money. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? I made her pay for this and made her pay for that because I knew that that's what addicts do. But they must have been proud of you when you, you were travelling, well, you were you doing see, all my, your stuff. They were totally proud of me. You know, yeah. my dad come, I remember my dad coming to get me off Concord. I was just like, you know, my son's just flown in on Concord. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was kind of insane. My mum and dad, you know, had a scrapbook. Mm -hmm. Which she still got to this mm -hmm. day. It's in that documentary. She was getting. I see that beautiful wee woman, man. Yeah, yeah. She was slagging her height. Yeah. You're a lot taller than I expected. <laughs> six two. Yeah, yeah. Us Scottish are all short asses. Yeah, of course you are. Yeah. My, my dad, my dad, as I said, he was Scottish. He was six four. Yeah. Yeah, his dad, but his dad was really short. And so, so how is your mum then? My mum's amazing. Yeah, she my, looks great, by the way. Yeah, she's she's doing really good. Uh, yeah, she's amazing. I had a row with her yesterday morning because one of her friends had read something that I'd said and and mis misread it as saying that I I blame my mum for my upbringing. Uh, saying that I she was a bad mum and I, I've never ever said that my mum was a wonderful mum yeah. uh, you know they weren't a problem I was the problem yeah of course you know we I blame mean? everybody else always yeah always 
And, you know, something, the magical thing about getting to know my dad was the fact that, you know, I could see so much of myself in my dad and the way, and mm-hmm. the way I am, the way my dad was. And my dad saw me get clean. He saw me obviously win my court case, but he saw me get clean. I remember going to him when I was six weeks clean and saying to him, Dad, uh, no, no, that's a lie. It was six months. I just got a rehab. And I went to see my dad and I said, look, you know, I'm six months clean. I want to apologize. And my dad went, why don't you fuck off and come back to me when you're six years? Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, that's a bit much in yeah. it. And, it was, and, you know, it, he was right because, you know, by, by the time I got six years of being clean and sober, I kind of realized all the mistakes that I made, yeah. you know, and what I was apologizing for. Because I was apologizing, you know, meant the apology I was giving to my dad at that point meant nothing. You grow a conscience, don't you? All yeah. the misery you've caused, all the destruction, all the pain. And that's the scary part of changing. That's why a lot of people don't like the thought of change because then you realize how much you're a cunt you actually were. Oh, you got to look, totally look at, you, listen, you know, for me, it, that's, you know, when you work a 12 step program, you get to that fourth step and you start to look at your resentment and you start to break it down and looking at your part in it. Mm. Fuck me, I, you know, I had no part in being <laughs> yeah. abused. I had no part in, yeah. in this. I had no part in that. I had a fucking massive part in all of it. Yeah. Do you get what I mean? Because I allowed these things to happen for my own personal gains mm-hmm. in so many ways. And, you know, the, the way I behave and the way I treat other people, I'm fucking totally in control yeah. of that stuff. You know, and, uh, and what I learned from from 28 years of using drugs and abusing drugs because there's a difference between drug use and drug abuse yeah. and I say this to a lot of people you know if you're using drugs and you're and you're you're drinking and you don't have a problem with it and it doesn't have a problem with you then that's fine if you're one of these people that can buy two grams of coke do one and leave the other one in the drawer for three weeks then that's that's mm. great but you know I'm one of those people that buys two grams yeah, of coke and then needs another four three yeah. an hour later you know because that's the way I am I'm an addict you know then that's fine if you're using drugs and you're, you're partying and you know when to stop that's amazing but when it goes beyond that and it becomes abuse and you start abusing yourself mm-hmm. and abusing other people it's a different st- story altogether yeah. and I think that when we work on ourselves and we look at that stuff and we, we go in really deep with that stuff and look at things right now I'm working on childhood trauma and I'm 13 and a half years clean and yeah to go back and look at that stuff because that stuff's what's that's dictated my life of course as and you'll still hold, have, have all that suppressed in your mind I always thought that I dealt with no, it because yeah, no, I never because yeah. I never looked at it yeah when you if don't look at something you think you de- yeah, dealt with yeah. it oh yeah yeah I'm, I, that, I'm over that because yeah. you never looked at it but the brain stores everything and oh, the, the thing is when you think about that even talking about that now if you think about that trauma 40 years ago 50 years ago then the brain releases a chemical to the pain and the trauma you had felt that day. So mm-hmm. it's to try and break the emotional connection, which can be done. There's a thing I do in Glasgow called um, Havening, okay. which is like touch therapy. Yeah. So we talk about the trauma and then replace it with a positive. So yeah. when you do think about the trauma, you don't get that depression and you think, oh, I don't want to yeah, think about Yeah, I, 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 I went to this guy here, um, called Michael Hebb when he taught me to use the, the tip of my tongue. Yeah. So when, I, when I'm talking about trauma and stuff like that, I use the tip of my tongue on the back of my teeth yeah. as a pressure point to change the neuropaths of, yeah. of how I do it. Because also when I, when I first got clean, I used to gurn. Whenever I DJ'd or I went into a situation mm-hmm. that I was uncomfortable with, I would go, my neuropaths would take me straight back to that point. Yeah. And when I thought of trauma, I did exactly the same thing. So if I was talking about child abuse or I was talking about my mum, Mm-hmm. being at the bottom of the stairs I, I would start doing those old behaviours because yeah. the brain would send those signals yeah 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 because have... the brain doesn't know what's real or what's fake the brain exactly. thinks that can be present moment whether it's 20 years ago 100 years 100%, ago 100% so, yeah. but you can change in your pathways and always preach that you can change oh, yeah, the way you, you think listen, and feel you can actually change yeah. anything yeah of course you can le- listen, yeah. one thing I've learned is that you can change absolutely fucking everything yeah. you know learn behaviours learn new ones yeah simple yeah do you know what I mean yeah yeah override those ones mm-hmm. with new ones yeah New learnt behaviours. Yeah. Healthy, respectful. Yeah, definitely. What was your catalyst then, Tony, for the change? What was that moment before <coughs> so, you basically um, died? Or was there someone come to you? Or yeah, was there a moment? For me, I think that, you know, the last 10 years of that using, there uh, there was so many gifts of desperation within that. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'd end up in a hospital and I think, okay, this is it. Of course, straight out the door again. You know. Did you ever um, contemplate suicide or anything? Uh n- I was, I'd like to say no, but it was always on my mind. I think taking I went, drugs to that extent, self-harming. Well, that I actually extent. one time, uh, I, I remember, 
um, I came, I'd been out for about four days and I was, it was in the crystal meth era and I, I came back to Pimlico and I was in my flat and I thought I can't do this anymore and I went to Vauxhall Bridge and I sat on the bridge and was going to throw myself in and I had no cigarettes <laughs> <laughs> so I went back to my house yeah. to get the cigarettes and I sat on the sofa and I thought oh fuck it I'm not going back there now but you know what <laughs> but you know that was yeah, the insanity yeah, yeah. of it do you yeah. know what I mean it was the absolute insanity yeah. of it and I would always pretend that I'd taken loads of tablets and then when my partner used, James used to finish with me like he would finish with me every other couple of weeks like oh, I can't do this with you anymore and I, I would end up in hospital every time every time like I would like to get, get hit by a car I would have taken loads yeah. of tablets I would have fallen down the stairs I had uh, asthma attacks were a good one yeah. uh, <laughs> I cry out for oh help oh my god yeah. the amount of times I'd be in hospital with lots of my son get James <laughs> and like literally he would turn up and he'd say there's fuck all wrong with him he does this all the time <laughs> in A&E yeah. and uh, <laughs> you know and then of course you know uh, there was there were times when I, I, I literally used to think I can't go on you know that towards the end all I ever thought about James was death I, every day that's all I ever thought about my own funeral um, who's coming who I wanted there who I didn't want there that changed weekly mm. you know uh, I was going to do a video <laughs> like saying you know of everyone I hated I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> and, uh, but you know I used to listen to um, these I'd say uh, these tracks I used to listen to Mary J Blige No More Drama and another track by which uh uh, a track called Believe by the Kings of Tomorrow and I used to play these songs on loop over and over and over again and and you know I used to think right I'm gonna No More Drama by Mary J Blige was gonna be what I was gonna get cremated to Footsteps you know um Teardrops yeah, by Womack nice and Womack yeah, yeah, yeah. being carried into yeah, that one, of course. That, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it all worked out. And it all worked out. But, you know, but the sad side to it was I, we laugh about it now because I, I've dealt with it. But, you know, yeah. at the time, it was real because you know, that's all I had to look forward to. Mm -hmm. I didn't have holidays to look forward to. I had death to look forward to yeah. because I'd gone so far with addiction. It had gone to that point. I weighed seven stone. I had no teeth. Uh, you know, I had nowhere to live. I was homeless again. You know, uh, for the love of one person kept me alive. And that what happened was one night I was at the Cross, which was this club in King's Cross, and James, my partner at the time, came in. And I remember turning around and thinking, oh, I can't deal with you tonight, mate. And he's come to cause trouble. And he came up and he put his hand on my shoulder and, and, and I was sitting there rocking backwards and forwards as I did, because that's what I did. Uh, which I thought was quite normal. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I was like pulling the and, uh and I remember him coming over and, then he, and he put his hand on my shoulder and he looked at me and he just said, what, what happened to you? And uh, it always makes me want to cry because, you know, that was it. That was a God, that moment, like, God given moment that changed my life. Mm. Because I looked at him and I was like, I burst into tears and I was like, I don't know. And it was like, if you have ever smoked sort of like really strong, like, uh, skunk and you smoke, smoke too much of it and you've got your head on the wall and the whole room is rushing yeah, spanning. that's what it was like yeah. and like suddenly my life I, come, I remember leaving the club and I, uh, uh, and I just I was like get me out of here and then we went home and I remember crying and then on the Monday I went to see the doctor and I said I need help so he sent me to a drug drug uh, drop-in centre and for about a week, I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And of course, like my that. addiction was so powerful because mm -hmm. that's all I knew. You know, I, I literally thought to myself, you can't ever get clean. What are you going to do? How can you, what are you going to do without drugs? Because I, my whole life was drugs. Everything I did was based on drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I, you know, I would pretend that I was clean. I changed dealers. All my, all, yeah, all my mates are still going, you know what it's like when you find yeah. the best Coke in London, everyone goes to the same dealer. So, um, you know, I was, that, I was that sniffer dog that always found the best mm -hmm. dealer. So we were, uh, so I changed dealers. So everyone was like, have you seen Tony? And he was like, no, he's, he's getting clean. I wasn't getting clean, I was just using another dealer. And I completely was manipulating the fact that I was trying to get clean so that I could prolong the pain. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't know any way, I didn't know another way of life. I did not know... That, that I could live without drugs. I did not think for a minute yeah. that was it. And, um, you know, slowly but surely, I started going to a, a Narcotics Anonymous meetings and, and I'd sit there and I'd think, oh, God, shut up. Like, taking everyone else's, you know, everyone else's um, uh, 
I can't even think of the fucking word. I'd sit there taking like everybody's itineraries apart from my own. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and slowly but surely I heard what I needed to hear. And, you know, then I, I still couldn't get clean. I would sit in NA meetings in the corner and, and gurning, <laughs> which was, didn't look good with one yeah. tooth. And, um, I'd go home and my partner, James, would say, you've used today. And I'd be like, no, 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 I've been at an NA meeting. And he'd be like, no, you've used. And I'd, you know, and him, I'd be like, no, I haven't. And he'd make me eat like things like uh, spaghetti carbonara. <laughs> you know, have you ever tried eating pancetta when you're high? <laughs> and like fucking, With one tooth? <laughs> yeah, you know, one tooth, one tooth pancetta, like the most cheesiest pasta. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, I, and he tortured me that way because he knew I was lying. And... Mm. Uh, and I literally that went on for a while and then what happened was one night I was in a uh, Narcotics Anonymous meeting and this big black lady was sitting there and, and I thought oh, I'll stay five minutes and I'll leave you know ticking mm -hmm. the boxes and she opened her mouth and she told me my story it was remarkable everything that came out of her mouth I related to and I, I remember leaving that meeting and I cried and within, uh, within two weeks I was in rehab I went to rehab for six months uh and, you know, when you go to rehab, they say to you, you can't go back to London. You can't go back to DJ and you can't mm. go back to that relationship. Yeah. And I remember on the last day there at my, when I was graduating, all my family were there. And um, I remember them saying it to me that morning. And I was like, I'm not going back to anything. I'm going forward. And I, and I, and I was going forward to London. And I went forward to that, to that relationship and I went forward to my career. And... You know, it wasn't easy. It wasn't not, recovery wasn't easy at first. Yeah. Because, you know, it was about change, changing everything without changing and doing the geographical. Uh, I came forward to London and, you know, of course, all, the, all of your using friends are like rats up, up, up a drain pipe. They're gone because mm -hmm. you're no longer the party. Yeah. So you're no use to them. Like all my friends never used to be yeah, to me yeah, when yeah. they got clean. And, uh, which, was a, which is a blessing in disguise because, mm -hmm. you know, at first you think, oh God, I've got no friends yeah. now that I'm sober. And, you know, it's about rebuilding. It's about brick by brick by brick by brick. Yeah. But without building yeah, a wall. and it's like taking... The scary part is taking full responsibility, not blaming your dad, not blaming your friends, not blaming relationships. It's to fully like admit I'm in control. I've made the fuck-ups. I'm going to change them. And that's, that's the beautiful thing of change. And listen, I take my hat off to you because what you're doing is amazing and I'm proud of you, man. And Thank you. You've done really well. And so going through your transition... When did you start getting work again? When did you start really building your confidence? So it took about confidence? a year. So I came out of treatment. I came back to L come forward to London. I was in London and... Uh, Were you scared? There was people just scared petrified. that you slipped petrified. back in? So but what I'd done, though, like, what I'd done was, when I was in treatment, I'd, I, I wrote a diary every day of what I went through in treatment. You know, like, sitting in the smoking hut with guys who've got wet brains that would set fire to their set fire to their clothes by yeah. accident thinking they were lighting a cigarette and all that stuff. I wrote this diary and what I did was when I came out of treatment I, I published the diaries in a in a London gay magazine over the course of six weeks. So for me it was kind of like, okay, this is this is this is me. There's no going back to that. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. It's out there, everyone knows. And you know, it was a slow process and I was petrified of, of playing tracks, petrified of going to clubs. But, you know, uh, it took about a year for my first gig. And, you know, in that year, I kind of was just like battling with a new career, new ideas. But you know what? I, I say this all the time. The, the best drug that I've ever, ever taken in my life is, is music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I went back into what I believed in. And that was music. And I knew that through that if I believed in believed in the music and believed in myself again I could I could take that career to where I wanted it to go yeah. and uh over the course of the like uh, the, the next couple of years I slowly but surely I was doing clubs again but I was doing the right clubs mm -hmm. I was choosing ones that I wasn't going to be in all night I was choosing clubs to work in that I could go and I could leave and but slowly but surely, I got addicted to the nightlife again. Yeah. I didn't get addicted to drink or drugs. I got addicted to other people's behaviours. Yeah. Could you see other people's weaknesses and oh, flaws? Oh, 100%. But, I, but, you know, I bought into it again. Yeah. You know, my addiction. Because I'd got, I'd got, I'd started working on myself. I did this, the first three to four mm -hmm. steps within a fellowship and kind of started to, to glide along. I thought, oh, I'm comfortable now. I'm yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. I don't need to do anything. Yeah. I'm all right today. And what happens is your behaviours take over. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. although I never ever picked up a drink or a drug, my behaviours become so off-key again. You know, I, I, I would go into flow 
with bitchiness. So I'd, I'd, I'd be in a room full of people and I'd start bitching at someone. Mm -hmm. Everyone else would laugh. The comedian in me takes over and I go into flow and before I know it, I've hurt everyone in that room's feelings. Yeah. I'm in recovery. I'm responsible for that stuff. Yeah. Before, when I was on drink or drugs, I would use that as an excuse not to be responsible. But you know what? I, I'm in, I'm, I no longer have that as, as, that as an excuse. Yeah. So I'm responsible to, for, for my own behaviours and it took a while for me to actually realise that. Do you get what I mean? Because yeah. I, you know, it took a lot of people saying, he hasn't changed. Yeah. A lot of people said that, you yeah. know, he hasn't changed, you know, he's still a cunt, you know, and you know what I was, and you know, yeah. but with, in recovery you learn, and, and, you, and you continue to learn, yeah. so I learned by my own mistakes, I learned by getting my, you know, if I, I'm like a, like a puppy dog, if I pissed in the corner you had to rub my nose in it. Yeah for me to actually learn those behaviors. And I changed, you know, change came along, but what happened was at six years clean, I lost everything again. I uh, didn't do the work on myself. I kind of got comfortable, got complacent, thought that, uh, you know, I was all right. The sex, you know, the sex, which I never ever treated. You know, I went to rehab, never mentioned it once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> never mentioned to anyone that I had a problem with sex. So you it was know. all blockages that you weren't admitting. Yeah, totally. I, you know, it was the one that I was, I was 41 yeah. when I got clean. I'm a middle life crisis. I was not going to let go of the sex. Mm -hmm. Sex was like, you know, I'm a gay man. I still got to have sex. So I still had something to prove. Yeah. And so I held on to that secret. And that secret was so much more destructive than the cocaine and the crystal meth and all of those other drugs combined. Because I was responsible for that damage I was causing in, tree, in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and at six years, I lost my house. I lost my partner. I left with two dogs. And uh, I went to live. I was homeless again at six years Fuck in recovery. Sick, Tony, how many times have you been homeless? Fucking mental. Absolutely mental. And you know, it, but it went straight back to that point. Straight back Square to that one, point. Isn't it? Straight yeah. back to that point. Although I'd never picked up a drink or a drug, I was completely spiritually bankrupt again. I was morally bankrupt. I had no, no self respect. I'd lost it all again. Mm -hmm. Everything. And, and being. Uh, in recovery and being, you know, uh, making out that I had this like perfect recovery to people was heart wrenching. It was yeah. awful. And uh, my friend said to me, okay, I want you to move into my house to help him get clean. And I moved in with George, as in boy George. Yeah, because you got boy George clean as well. Did you yeah, take I did, him yeah, to yeah. the AA? Yeah. yeah, what happened was uh, for ages I'd see, uh, I'd come out of treatment, I, I would bump into him, those God given moments. I'd like, one time I was crossing the road in Angel. And uh, he was in a car at the traffic lights. And, and, I, and I saw him and I was like, oi. And he, I'm down the window and he's like, you got out of the car. He's like, I'm, I'm sober. And his legs are going all over the place. <laughs> and he's going, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sober. And I was like, you're such a liar. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you've got to remember, I've known him since I, I was 30. Yeah. I said, you're a fucking liar. And he's like, no, 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 I am. And then what I did was I kept hounding him. I kept calling him and calling him and calling the house. And his sister was there. And she was like, you know, oh he's, he's upstairs he's in a really bad way and I was like take the phone to him now and she was like alright and I was like I'm coming to get you and he was like, he was like no, what I said I'm going to a meeting I'm coming to get you and he was like oh no I've, uh, I'm three days clean I've just got back from a trip and I said <laughs> even better I'm coming to get you now and he was like, he came and met me. He came to meet me. In fact, he, he went, I'll get my brother to drive me. And he, he came to meet me and He's now 12 years clean. That's amazing, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and, you know, I moved in his house with him. You know, that's another God-given thing. You know, the, the stuff that I was going through put me, put us back together again. Mm. And um, I moved in with George. And, you know, he, you know, he's one of the most amazing people on this planet. Mm -hmm. You know, he, for, you know, the trauma that he's been through in his life and the rebuild of his own career and where he is today is, is all down to recovery. Yeah. It's all down to recovery. It like takes myself. courage, yeah, yeah. And People just need to keep soldiering on, and life never stops. It's, we're no, constantly it working on. We're constantly a working process to make changes, to make sacrifices, yeah. to learn that we've still got fucking problems. We're going to constantly make mistakes, yeah, 100%. But, but that's the beauty of life. So after your six years, fucking it again. What was the transition again? <laughs> we just so the transition again was so I, I basically, you know. James, my partner at the time, my ex-partner, should I say, you know, he had catfished me and catfished me and catfished me and caught me out, you know, making li liaisons to meet with these boys and stuff like this. And it was always him. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, but I always knew. <laughs> but it was really weird, you know, when he was doing that stuff, I would read it and I think, that's James. 
Mm-hmm. I know that's him. I know the way he's, he's, he's written so, this. Yeah, yeah. And I would still go through with it. There was a part of me that was so crying out for help that wants to stop. Mm-hmm. Um, that I would uh, that I went through with all these times and still denied it, mm-hmm. caught red-handed, still denied it. I'm just here shopping, yeah. or you know, all of that stuff. It's just insane. The insanity of addiction was so. It, I just I'd gone with it again. It yeah. had got me again. Compulsive liar. And what had happened? Yeah, I'd lie on lies. Mm-hmm. No one would ask me at the time because yeah. they knew full well I'd I'd lie about yeah. it. And, and what had happened was I uh, I got on my knees and I asked for help and I found a new uh, someone. I went to a friend called uh, my mate Gary and I asked him for help. And he, he offered to take me on and uh, work the steps with him. And, and yeah, that was... A change <laughs> again. Say, yeah, again. And, and you know what? That's where the, the real magic happened. Yeah. Because I suddenly realised that I, how easy I could lose everything. Yeah. How easy. I think you need that speed bump. I was two years clean. And then I thought I was strong enough. Everything, I'm great. I don't need this shit. Fucked it. Ripped the whole ceiling down full year. All the negatives come in. The drink, the drugs, Always. the sex, the gambling. And then I re- but I, I came off it quicker this time because I realised how good I'd felt the two years off yeah, it. Yeah, you had it. My family was better. I had money in my pocket. It was changed. So when you've made all the transitions and the changes, you're in a great place now. So you've got your own show now as well. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, you've got your own show now yeah you're doing your own oh, stuff yeah, interviewing do, great do, names you've got the recovery on YouTube yeah. and hopefully that'll be picked up and taken somewhere else yeah, I think it will because you've had Kelly is it Kelly, Kelly Osborne, Osborne we've Russell had Lapp. Russell Brand we've had um, Dan, a girl called Danny St James we've had uh, Trisha Goddard we've had Meg Matthews we've got some amazing people lined up for the next series you know it's like um because it's real. It's like this. It's like us two talking. Yeah. But it's a conversation. Do yeah. you know what I mean? It's therapy. Yeah, it totally is. And, and you know, that therapeutic value of one addict helping another addict yeah. is, is unparalleled. It's a powerful you know? thing. And so many people watching us will get so much inspiration for yourself from your story, from Crystal Meth Crack, and understanding that you didn't f- keep on hating your mum or your dad. You no. forgave them and loved them. And that's an, that's the beautiful thing about life. You know, you can't, you can't ask for forgiveness if you can't forgive. Give. Yeah, yeah. You have to, you know, it, life is a two-way street and when we double park, nothing can get past yeah, it. Yeah. And it's about realising that, you know, it, it, it's a two-way street and you have to keep it flowing mm-hmm. on both sides. My side of the street today is clean on every yeah. respect. And there's days when it isn't and those are the, da- the worst days of my life. Yeah. In recovery, I can still have a bad day. Yeah. Trust me, I can yeah. wake up. Of course. I a thought will come into my head and I think today's a really good day to do something really fucking stupid yeah. and I'll message someone or do something really inappropriate mm-hmm. and what happens is my phone will go and it'll be a sponsee and they will have a problem bigger than that and it yeah. will make me think what are you doing mm-hmm. or you know you know because I always I, I've learned <laughs> you always get caught yeah. so oh, there's no yeah. point Truth in always any comes of it out, yeah. no point but in any you've got to it. understand we're human beings as well Tony we're going to make mistakes we do the thing is I've got more problems and more fucking shit happened in my life now than I did when I was fucking fucked up but the thing is I'm not hiding from it no I'm, I'm accepting it I accept the pain if I accept the pain then I can release the pain you so could, that's the magic word yeah. that acceptance it's, yeah. you know as soon as we accept where we're at and, and you know instead of thinking all the time oh why am I here why is this happening to me hmm. how can I change this how, yeah. how do I get out of this place you know it's about turning why into how and, and acceptance and responsibility and, and you know recovery is a wonderful thing but you have to work it you yeah. have to work for it yeah do you know what I mean you so, don't just stop doing yeah. Drink or drugs. Yeah. How's life then now? Are you back working? Are you life now is um incredible for me. Um, I'm probably more busy than I've ever been, even through COVID and lockdown. Life, you get creative. You know, you know. For me today, I um life's amazing. Yeah, it's a I have thing. freedom today. Yeah. I actually have freedom. My partner's in recovery, David. We, uh, you know, my career has gone through the roof. I'm traveling all over. You know, working for everybody again yeah. uh, and all the new ones um, <laughs> yeah you know what it is but it's really weird because people go oh the last three years things have gone really mad for you and it's like it's not been three yeah. years it's been 13 years of regrowing yeah. and rebuilding he building trust again with people 100% because we burn all the bridges don't we we do yeah, yeah. and what I've learned is just to build new ones yeah. do you get what I mean and, and that's the beauty of life you can yeah. how did you end up friends with all the like, designers because you've worked with all the biggest fashion 
names yeah. and industry house yeah. is that just for the DJing as well yeah no I mean literally uh, back in the day I, I used to work for, with the, all the labels then and as I say most of those big designers of today yeah. come from that era yeah. of like you know the, uh, Edward Emmenfels from British Vogue yeah. all those people we all come from that same place of yeah. creativity the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s so growing up in that and, and, and learning and making sure that people know you're back and you're doing what you're doing yeah. and you're fucking good at what you do yeah. do you know what I mean and, and it, uh, it doesn't take long for people to cotton on yeah how's Elton John because he's clean as well Elton's amazing Did Elton you? and David are David Furnish are two of the most nicest people on the planet you know what they do for our for everybody in this world is insane you know they do so much with the egaf and they do so much personal stuff with uh just anyone whenever there's a problem elton will fix it yeah it's amazing yeah like, you're yeah. doing amazing man and I, like i said before i'm proud of you for the things you're doing in your recovery channel people can watch that uh, follow tony's instagram page anything plans for the future what's the plans before we finish up tony the plans for the future just uh I've got a book coming out. Um, we've got a few various we're in talks about doing a few different other TV stuff at the moment. Um, I just, I just want to carry on doing what I'm doing. You know, I'm 55. I've got to think. You know, I don't want to be. Old bastard. I, <laughs> I am an old bastard. But you know what? I don't want to be the dad at the disco. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I don't feel like that but right now. But it's in your blood. Yeah, and I don't feel like I'm going to be the dad at the disco just yet. Nah. But you know what? I'm really enjoying what I'm doing, and people are really enjoying it as well. And and that's amazing. And that's yeah. the, you know so. I, you know, I'm very much like, as I said at the beginning of this interview, I, I never had goals. And today I do. I kind of just think, okay, this is where I want to be in five yeah. years. About structure. Yeah, I don't, I don't want a house in Monaco. I don't want a yeah. yacht. and I don't want any of that stuff. I want to have freedom. I want to have love. And I want to have self-respect. And that's enough for me. Yeah, and some enough well, peace. Everything else that comes around it is, is yeah. a bonus. As long as I've got that stuff, as long as I can go to bed at night knowing that I've done nothing but good in that mm -hmm. day, yeah. it's fucking all I yeah. all I want in yeah. life. Because you've worked with like Victoria Beckham, David Beckham. Yeah, how, I work how with are they? Dave. They're amazing. The Beckhams, listen, you know, I, uh, the Beckhams are incredible. You know, it's like, they get really, they get such a hard time, like anybody does. You know, we, we as human beings, we build these people up, we build them into icons and then we love to tear them down. Yeah. And, you know, Victoria... Normal person, amazing. David, brilliant. Amazing parents. The kids mm -hmm. are the most nicest kids you'll ever meet in your life. They're real kids. They yeah. don't have this grandiosity of like, oh, we're the Beckhams. Yeah, yeah. They don't have that. David, I've never, you know, I can go away on trips with him. And I, I mean, literally, I, I bellyache with laughter because mm -hmm. it's just like, it's so funny. Do you yeah. get what I mean? Because they're normal people. You know, it's like all of my friends, you know, whether it be supermodels or whatever they do, that's their careers. That mm -hmm. doesn't make them un 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 like unhuman. Of course. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's an illusion. It's all bullshit. What of you see in the news. Of course it I've is. We all bleed the same. We all struggle the same. We've all got problems. We've all no, got insecurities. No, I did the life set for the other night for for Pride, a charity event, and you know people were like you furloughed your staff, and it's like she runs a business like anybody would run furlough their staff. Yeah. She's running a business that's not making any money. Yeah. Of course, she's going to furlough yeah, her course. staff. You know, it, you know, it, it, she's making mm -hmm. sure her staff are okay. She's, yeah. Instead of laying her staff off because her business is shut. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Like anyone else, you know. Oh, you pay your, you know, you, you earn enough money. She, you're, 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 you're spending taxpayers' money. Uh, <laughs> isn't she a taxpayer? <laughs> yeah, and if they're paying tax, they're paying it through the ass. You know more that, than right? anybody else. Hello, let's put yeah, all of them together. Yeah, yeah. You know, fuck off. Yeah. So. It's been amazing listening to your story, brother. It's been an absolute pleasure. For anybody watching that's in the struggle, Tony, what advice would you give for them? Open your mouth. Open your mouth. If you don't open your mouth, you don't get fed. Literally, just take that, that, that leap of courage and say to someone, I've got a problem. Uh -huh. I've got a problem. You know, I get messages all day long on, on my Instagram, on the DMs, because I, I always say to people, if you've got a problem or you think you've got a problem, you're welcome to DM me and I'll talk to you. And people always go... Oh, you, 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 what, you're going to reply to everyone? And I actually reply to everyone. Because yeah. uh, you know what? You're taking the time to message me. I'm going to talk to you. Yeah. you know, it takes up a fucking lot of my yeah, time. Yeah. But you know what? I do do it because you know what? There's so many people that you can help that way that need help. And yeah. it, the first step is opening your mouth. And that could potentially save a life, the fact that you give other people attention. But, Tony, for coming Thank on you. today and telling your story, and you're doing amazing for being over 13 you the years. fucking Liz. Glasgow yeah, weather with you, didn't you? This is sunshine for us. Um, but it's an absolute pleasure. Can't wait to see what you do for the future. God bless you, brother. God bless you, too. Thank, Thank you. you.